One of the earliest memories of industry as a small boy were actually coming along this very canal when I was about seven or eight years old with my father on a bicycle. Now, I've never been able to swim, you know. I used to ride along the edge of this here towpath or the, the actual curve on the edge. And it's a wonder I never fell in, you know. And it was a strange place, you know. It's amazing that really it's survived all the, you know, 50 years it's still here uh, uh, and all the... The thing is, it, it was like a time warp, you know. There were the remains of old colliery workings, wooden fit headgears, and bits of old jib cranes that had all fallen down. And uh, it were all very sad in a way, you know. Uh, but it never left my mind, you know. It got me my first interest in industry going in a way. <laughs> The Industrial Revolution was a time when Britain invented machines that were to change the world. It was one of the most important periods in our history. But Fred felt it had never really had the attention it deserved. Fred was very passionate about engineers and machinery from the past. It was a love affair with Fred. I recall when I first came here and Fred showed me all around the garden and explained all about the machines here, all the steam engines, and it was like somebody who was explaining like a proud father would about a child. What each little item of machinery consisted of, what it did, how it had been made, a lot of it went over my head because of course a lot of it was technical and I couldn't understand what he was saying, but the passion that was there, and I think most people tapped into that passion, who was able to communicate that very well. Through this passion for Britain's industrial past and the machines of a bygone age, Fred reminded us of a time when Britain led the world. Between 1710 and 1712, Thomas Newcomb invented a brand new type of steam engine, the atmospheric engine, which was designed solely for one purpose, to pump water from deep mine shafts. The first one was installed here in Staffordshire at a colliery and it proved to be the world's most successful steam engine. And of course it was used near here at Dudley Castle for pumping water out of the many coal mines that were in the area. There's actually very few Newcomen pumping engines left. And here at the Black Country Living Museum, they built a full-size replica with a beautiful engine house. You know, when it's actually in motion, you can, you, you can like, step back in time to 1712. On the end of the beam, of course, you can see the pump rod, which disappears down the mine shaft to the pumps and the sump at the bottom. This, of course, forces up the water up the rising main and, and then they let it run away wherever they can. You know. For a long time, you never quite understood why people didn't really appreciate Britain's industrial heritage. And I suppose it started 40 or even 50 years ago and places like this and Beamish and Ironbridge all began to get an interest in it, but it needed popularising. And one of the things that Fred really did was, of course, bring it to the TV audience, which increased it hugely and got more and more people interested. Um, we've got to be very grateful for all he did there. Hello, oh, Roger. <laughs> you all right? Yeah, it's not so bad, thanks, Fred. Yeah, this is Roger, who's the chief engineer of this wonderful creation. Uh, he won't tell me how it works. He's one of the few men who actually knows how it works. So I stop it, Fred, while we're talking? And yeah. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Is that the break? That's it, that's a bit of string and the all-important yeah. nail. Yeah, you don't seem to turn any taps off, do you, when, to stop the thing? Well, we've got a very simple boiler. And yeah. When Newcomen conceived of this engine, there was no boiler technology. The only thing there was was like a giant kettle from the mm. brewing industry. And that's literally what this is. The original had a copper bottom and a lead top, which occasionally would melt. Mm. And the cylinder <laughs> is mounted directly above that with a valve. 
it's quite simple, really, isn't it? Oh, oh, it works. It is simple, but it's it very, been, very difficult to yeah, engine to keep running. Like, Most yeah. of the work is in keeping the fire right because you've got yeah. no other controls. You say yeah, no valves yeah, or anything. Yeah, so yeah. if the fire's wrong, yeah. it just stops and it'll stop very quickly. Mm. Industrial history had got almost a little bit sort of academic in in some ways. Uh, it had started off with volunteers and then had become a little more professional, a little more academic. And I think Fred's programmes have actually brought the, the whole thing back more into the public realm uh, and allowed just the normal person to become, to feel they're able to get more involved in industrial history. Well, Rob Jurel is now going to activate the engine, aren't you, Roger? That's what it's all about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Really, in 1712, this was the cutting edge of technology, you know. Before then... <laughs> 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 oh dear. Shall we carry on? <laughs> I hope you got that. Uh, Fred had a real talent for uh, raising awareness in the areas that he personally was interested in. Um, great at uh, telling stories and uh, great at uh, condensing. Uh, the uh, years of, uh, of politics and finance and um, engineering and technology into uh, a, a digestible story. A good example of this is the way Fred tells the story of Richard Trevithick and the early development of the steam engine in Cornwall. Richard Trevithick was a brilliant engineer and inventor and he never really got true recognition for his contribution to the development of the steam engine. He was a larger-than-life character who, who sort of were famed for his burnuttle fighting. And he had this wonderful ability to solve problems that perplexed better engineers, more well-educated engineers, like a bit like me, sort of semi-illiterate, you know, but yet he had this brilliant touch of solving these unbelievable problems. He made a fortune and lost a fortune. He went off to South America to the, the silver mines there and came back a sort of broken man, you know. The thing is that after all them important things that he did for the development of the steam engine, you know, he died a pauper and nobody really knows where he's buried. I think industrial history and the whole understanding of our industrial past is a bit of a Cinderella in historical terms, and people have tended to go for, um, for, for, for kings and queens and, and high-flown lives and people in very fancy costumes. But actually, um, I think Fred helped people to understand that there's something very special, very heroic about the Industrial Revolution and about the um, lives that it uh, influenced and about the things and the places that it produced. Trivithick was born at Yelogan near Camborne, but his family soon moved to this cottage here nearby and his father was the manager of the Wheel Chance Copper Mine. He spent his childhood here and went to the village school, but the headmaster's uh, description of him were He's a loafer and inattentive and, and sort of very slow. He spent his time wandering around looking at the tin mines and the machinery of, that existed at the time. He amazed his superiors and so-called men of better education by his unbelievable ability for solving mechanical problems without the aid of arithmetic and all that, just by his own intuition, you know. He felt that he knew more than you did, but not that much more, that he'd just discovered whatever it was two minutes before you switched on your television, and he couldn't wait to tell you about it. Trevithick's use of strong steam meant that you could build an engine that weighed about 10 tonnes that would do the same work as an engine that weighed 650 tonnes. All of Trivithick's early engines were designed to run along the road, you know. And here at Camborne, they built a reproduction of the Puffin Devil, which is a quite interesting piece of machinery. And the lads on top here, are, you know, some one of them was going to tell me how it all works and all about it. There's so much unlike um, sort of slick television presenters, which I thought was great. I mean, I don't, not many television presenters uh, wear overalls and mean it, if you see what I mean, or cloth caps. They'd wear it because their stylist told them to. 
and um, and but but that wasn't wasn't the case with Fred at all. Uh, you knew he was wearing cloth cap for real, which was fantastic. Passion and enthusiasm are hugely important in trying to get people involved in their heritage. Um, and I think that Fred did a great deal in this, especially in industrial heritage, which has been an area which, although it's been expanding over the years, has very much been um, misunderstood by many, many people. Whilst he was working as the engineer at the wonderfully named Ding Dong Mine in Penzance, super name though, isn't it? Uh, he developed his, his first high-pressure engine, which of course led to these great monsters like this one here at Cornish Mines. You know, I mean, this is a super engine, isn't it? Biggest one I've ever seen, you know. The advances Trilithic made in pumping engines and winding engines definitely gave Cornwall an unbelievable prosperity in between about 1800 and 1870. Another great idea that Richard Trevithick came up with was the chimney, of course, which improved the draft on the boilers and, and eventually became quite common in all industrial areas on the skyline. The engineers and manufacturers of Cornwall started to build their own engines, their own pumping engines, like Allman Brothers of Camborne and Harveys of Ale, eventually became world famous in the field of pumping engines. This behind me is the mine at Levant, and it went more than 1,800 feet down and then more than a mile under the Atlantic Ocean towards America. Quite an incredible feat, really. If you look down into this great chasm here, you can see various flights of stone steps coming up the cliffside. Um, and now, in the olden days, before the days of steam winders and wire ropes and cages, the miners had to get down the face of the cliff far down nearer to the sea as they could and then enter by an adit that met the main shaft going down and then continued the journey for 1,800 feet on ladders with various platforms down the shaft and then of course they got to go for a mile underneath the ocean before they actually started work you know they must have been some special men this engine there was what, what were known as the fast winder and of course it's based on a James Watt beam engine principle, but it was built by Harvey's of Ale in 1840, and it wound skips of oil from a shaft 1,800 feet deep in five minutes. Right, Dick, can you, can you oh, let me have a go? Yeah, certainly. <laughs> What's well, first job? Take the break off. Yeah, take a break off. Right. How many turns? Wait a minute. Uh, go on. And I know. It's OK. And then what? Uh, cover a bit of steam. Yeah, about there. Ah, wonderful. <laughs> I think Fred's contribution was enormous because his passion and interest wasn't for a single subject or a single machine. It was, it was his passion was for steam engines in their context, whether it was on railways or in factories, it didn't really matter. So I think his programmes had such a wide appeal because it wasn't just looking at one machine after another, it was looking at places and people. Yeah, of course, up there you can see the, the great beam rocking up and down. I think it's a bit unusual because the, the pumping engines have half the beam sticking outside into space. This one's all inside the engine house. It's a bit different. I suppose the one who did the winding would be here all day, you know, he, he wouldn't like the ocean and the wind blowing on him, would he? Yeah, down below there, that's the, the condenser, you know, which of course makes the vacuum to, to make the piston go up and down a lot easier. Um, you know, with his, his approximately 14 pounds per square inch less uh, pressure, you know, against the steam, you know, that makes it work much more economically. That's why Cornish beam engines are very economical. It'd be a feat of engineering just getting the engineer itself, wouldn't it, on the edge of this great oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. No heavy lifting gear or anything no, like that. No, no, no. I think Fred had really quite a big influence in popularising um, the Industrial Revolution and the history of machinery. I mean, Fred obviously has a passion for machinery, and that, I think, comes over in every programme. And he 
particularly loved the golden age of engineering, of me the golden age of mechanical engineering. I mean, in the 1700s and before that, ma machinery is stuff that people have to work quite hard to make work at all. So it tends to be iron and black and with big pieces of wood in it. In spite of Newcomen's unbelievable success and its worldwide acclaim for these engines, they had a lot of weak points, you know, like this particular bit here is the injection cock for the condensing the steam inside the cylinder. And of course, what happened was every time, every stroke, the cold water going in cooled off all the cylinder. So part of the next lot of steam had to warm it all up again, you know. We're all right if you have lots of fuel, but, you know, places like Cornwall were, you know, they've got to bring it a long way, you know. I mean, it's reputed that there were one company in Cornwall that actually had owned a thousand horses to get the coal from the, the sea where had come from South Wales down into where the, the tin mines were. And, of course, reputed to burn a, as much as 12 tonnes of coal in a day, you know. So when you took it away from the coal fields, it weren't very efficient at all. And they were also quite dangerous, you know, like the type of boiler that they had were a pretty flimsy affair, you know. Some of them were made of iron plate, some of them were like top part were lead. And of course it's not noted for its great strength. And of course there were frequent explosions, even though they only used very low pressures, you know. I mean, the, the only pressure they needed were a few pounds, you know, to make the thing work. The other thing, of course, that were, were wrong with it in a way were it only produced a reciprocating motion, which means up and down, which meant it could only be used really for any great use in pumping the coal mine shafts out, getting the water up. What really were needed were a few improvements in it and some form of turning it into a rotary machine, you know, that could drive the new machines in textile mills and ironworks that were springing up all over the place at this period in our history. By the early 1800s and through to the early 1900s, that's the golden age of mechanical engineering. Those very, very beautiful machines which you can see running and, and you can just look at them and they are sort of logic expressed in metal. In that golden age of, of mechanical engineering, um, Fred really helped to bring that to life for people, I think. Because, of course, the Industrial Revolution really is the only time when this island has been centre stage in terms of world history. This is the time when Britain led the world. It's its big contribution to the world, really. the man who decided to connect the cylinder up to the crankshaft is Richard Trevithick. And along with a gentleman in Leeds called Matthew Murray, they developed the horizontal type of engine. And there were literally thousands of engines like this made from little teeny ones, three foot long, to the biggest one on record were made by a company in Bolton called Lick Hargreaves's. And reputedly the cylinder were 10 feet long. It had a 10 foot stroke on it, you know. An incredible machine, you know, um, and all. I don't know how many hundred horsepower it were, but it's supposed to be the biggest single cylinder horizontal steam engine ever made. I've got some drawings of it in a book at home. You've only got to look at some of the work that uh, Fred did when he's looking at some of the great mill engines or the like and going almost overboard about them to realise that he appreciated the skill and the quality that went into them and that that comes over and people stop to think about it and not everything the Victorians did was great or good or good quality by any means but he tended to pick the really good things and put over exactly how important it was to get things right. The horizontal steam engine was much easier to manufacture in all sizes and and sort of, uh, you didn't have to have a great big tall engine room to keep it in. Uh, and so they made a, a, hundreds and hundreds of them, you know, everywhere. Really, to build an engine like this, all that you needed were a big lathe, a shaper, and a good iron founder. And you could make one in a shed in my yard. I've more or less done it myself once or twice. Industrial history and industrial archaeology is still a relatively new area. 
um, and greatly misunderstood by many people. You see a, a, like a, a load of old angle iron rustling away in a corner, not realising the importance of that. And so through bringing it to television and bringing it to life, um, Fred has been uh, hugely important in making people, the wider population, understand the importance of our industrial heritage. Britain's industrial heritage is absolutely unique, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. This is where it all started. And we can't go around losing these wonderful buildings and wonderful monuments to that age of utter ingenuity and, uh, and great, great um, expansion. Um, and so Fred has been extremely important in putting that on television and getting people, and therefore getting politicians, the ones who have the power of life and death over these, these great monuments, um, to understand what it's all about. Steam power didn't really cause the Industrial Revolution, but it played a very important part in it. The factory system, of course, were developed from the, the textile industry. And of course, all this were done a long time before the steam engine became fully developed. Quarry Bank Mill at Style is hidden away behind Manchester Airport. And it is, without a doubt, one of the very best places where you can see the steam engine and water power working together. The original water wheel was designed and built by Sir William Fairburn of Manchester, who were very famous for his, what they call, suspension water wheels, which, of course, I rather think comes from the fact that they put the first segment in the bottom of the water wheel pit and anchor it to the spokes and it'll be suspended. Move it round one and put another in, move it round one and put another in, and eventually it'd end up round. The thing is that the original one was so, uh, far gone, you know, and rotten. They, decided, they found this one at a place called Pateley Bridge in Yorkshire. And of course, they'd obviously done a heck of a lot of work on it. All the plating's all brand new, you know. The, some of the spokes are original, I think. They're quite rusty. When this water wheel was first installed, you know, steam engines were quite well developed, but they were a, a bit unreliable, you know, and of course, this thing runs for nothing, you know, and all the trouble with breaking down and bringing coal and all that. It still was a formidable source of power, as you can see with the size of it, you know, and looking through these reduction gears behind me, you know, a lot of power there to drive all the machinery in the mill. These things are called looms, they're spinning cloth with. The noise levels are terrific. Can you imagine what it must have been like with, in a room with 1,500 of these things all going at the same time for 16 hours a day, you know? You can see why it's all faded away. No wonder they were all dead. He could be a mate. You, you'd want to sit in a pub drinking with Fred and listening to his tales. And I think that's what the, that was the, um, one of Fred's best points. You could, you could relate to him, he, he, was, he was a typical working man, and yet he'd got this fascination for, for the subject that he loved so much, and that really came over, and I think that's how people have become more interested in it. Even today, the, the weaving shed takes its power from the water wheel, you know, and this is part of the transmission, this great vertical shaft that comes up through three floors up to this level where the weaving shed is. And of course the bevel gears and then the horizontal shaft, and then the counter shafts and then the looms proper. Well, these things were always this great source of trouble. The great weight of a vertical shaft, especially in a spinning mill, which nearly always were four and five stories high. The great problem when they always got hot at the bottom. And of course, once it got hot, the whole mill had to stop. He's put engineering history onto, uh, onto a higher plane than it was before, certainly and there must be many museums around the country that are, are grateful for it. Um, as, to, as to people's understanding of engineering, I think that has also helped. He was so careful to actually show you something and how it, something operated or how it was built. Basically, the transmission, you know, into the, from the water wheel comes up the shaft, up the vertical shaft. Then, of course, it, it's transmitted into these long ones, which are called line shafts. In reality, these are not very long, you know. I mean, some of them in the olden days, when the torque started at one end, the other end didn't move for a bit till they'd actually twisted the shaft. There was such great weight on them, you know. And of course, they started off at the driven end, quite thick, 
and by the time they'd gone the full length of the weaving shed, they, they kept stepping down a bit in diameter, you know, because of the twisting action. Quite an interesting, this book upon book about mill shaft fixing and, and mill writing that, that, you know, it became quite an art, you know, setting up line shafts. Number one, they've got to be exactly dead straight and level. If, they, if they're a bit bent, you know, it creates a lot of trouble. The great problem with water wheels, they were very economical to run and all of that like, but there were one big problem. In times of drought, the work stopped and everybody had warm. Steam power was only introduced, really, to help out the water wheel, you know. Forward-thinking mill owners soon realised that it was a better form of power. In 1810, the mill owner, Samuel Gregg, installed this beam engine, not, not to be the, the main source of power, but just to help out the water wheel in times of drought and low water. James Watt came up with a magnificent idea, you know, he separated the condensing department from the cylinder, you know, separate unit altogether. Um, the, what happens in this case is this here is the valve chest, this rectangular shaped iron box. And this is the exhaust pipe, and when the steam's exhausted from the cylinder through the valve chest, it comes down this pipe and it goes into the condenser. And on the other end of the, of the beam, the rod that goes down the well, that's pumping up cold water, and of course that goes through a pipe round the back here and into the condenser and condenses the steam, you see, which of course helps the engine, you know, the engine is not working against 15 pounds per square inch of atmosphere, so it runs a lot sweeter. It became, the engine didn't just show you what was, what was in front of you, he would actually explain the pistons, the valves, and uh, never was he happier when he was on the top of a beam engine or something like that, looking down. Here we can see the beam in all its glory, you know, like this is, of course, is the connecting rod end, which is connected to the crankshaft. This bit here works the water pump that pumps the water, the cold water, for the condenser. And then, of course, James Watt's biggest and best thing, the parallel motion. Watt came up with this wonderful system of levers that does away with the arc that the end of the beam would strike, you know, if you just connected the connecting rod to the end of the beam. At each stroke, it would try and bend the connecting rod, which would be terrible for the, the cylinder and the, and the connecting rod itself. Um, and this is it, the magical system of levers that keeps the piston rod in a straight line and the end while the, the end of the beam goes up and down. Throughout his series, Fred's visited some of these the places that are trying to restore our industrial past. And maybe the public didn't realise the work that was going on there. When you look at some of the places Fred's visited, even us at this, this site didn't realise that that was happening. It really brought it home to people that people are trying to restore and that there are some fascinating, interesting things there for people to see. The series of programmes that um, we did on television um, featured you know, the, the, the machines of the Industrial Revolution, basically, um, and our empire was based um, on, on that Industrial Revolution. We exported engineers to the world um, and Fred brought that back into the public eye um, through the series of programmes he made. 